Hello, welcome along to another edition of Sporting Lives. This time, I am delighted to welcome former New Zealand uh, Test swing bowler and um, and television and radio cricket commentator and personality, I'm told as well, <laughs> uh, Simon Dool. Welcome along, Dools. Thanks very much. Yeah, nice to be here. Thanks for your time. Um, we want to look at your career. We want to get your opinions on the game. Um, we want to find out a little bit more about um, some of those Dooley secrets <laughs> as well. Um, so let's let's jump in really with where did it all begin cricket wise? You know, coming from from New Zealand, which is such a massive, massive rugby playing mm. country. Why cricket? Um, family really. Um, Dad was a, a pretty good cricketer. Played um, most of his career with about fifteen or twenty percent vision in one eye only. So he only had um, yeah about twenty percent vision. I think they worked out towards the back end in his uh, left eye. So he was a left-handed batsman. Right eye was okay. Um, but still played to a representative level, and then um, yeah, all all my brothers um, got three brothers, two sisters, big family. I'm the second to youngest, and it was just kind of backyard stuff. Um, so you know, oldest brother probably had more talent than all of us put together and wasted it. Um, the next one down didn't really play much cricket, and then Lincoln, my next next one up for me, played a lot for Wellington, and um, and so it was just a, a family thing that that kind of. We used to play every summer at home, backyard, we had a swimming pool, we'd sort of play cricket for a couple of hours, jump in the pool for half an hour and then get back to the cricket again. So that's kind of how it all started. And did the, the, your older brothers kind of look over their shoulders saying, well, it's easy for you, you've had some example <laughs> setters, you've had that sort of battle, because there's no bigger battle than sibling rivalry, is there? Yeah, and, and that's the thing, I think, um, you know, I, I guess you're probably, it's a school of hard knocks, isn't it? When, when you're the youngest one as well. You're, you're the one that has to do all the bowling in the backyard. That's probably why I couldn't bat at a younger age. But, um, you know, they, yeah, they, it was pretty hard, pretty hard school and some hard lessons learnt in the backyard. Um, the old man used to stand in the, uh, well, stand at the window inside the house and uh, lean out and up, try and umpire from deep mid wicket, which didn't help uh, a lot of the decisions going your way. But uh, it was it was great fun. And, you know, yeah, as I say, I, I learnt, I learned a heck of a lot from, uh, from the, you know, from Gavin and Lincoln in particular, the older boys. And was it always just cricket? I mean, people who tend to play professional sport are usually good at several things. Yeah, I played a lot of hockey, um, played uh, rep hockey um, up until, well, I went back and actually played hockey after, even after I'd finished playing cricket. So um, absolutely loved that. Golf has always been a passion. Mum and dad were um, club captains at the golf club. So I would, I would end up at the golf club probably... 9, 10, 11, 12 years old. It's been about three or four years going to golf every Saturday morning. And I would play three rounds in a day. And the old man would play one round and then spend a fair amount of time in the 19th and then we'd go home. So that was kind of how it was. So I got um, I got pretty good at golf by the time I was about 12, um, 13. I was down on a, a 9, 10 handicap um, and then kind of gave it away until the cricket finished. And coming from such a, a sizable family that I'm guessing you were not lacking for for family support in what you did? No, not at all. Um, you know, it was great. The old man was was working a lot uh, on weekends, so mum would mum would drive us. So the early days, I remember the early days, we'd all um, get down to Pukekohe where I grew up um, and jump on a, a, a sort of a national bus service and we would go to Papatoe, which was about an hour and 20 minutes trip on a bus because that was the better competition to play in. And we would end up in Papatoe every Saturday morning, so we'd be catching a bus at about 6.40 a.m. I think it was, 6.30, 6.40 a.m., jumping on the bus at um, at Pukekohe and an hour and 20 minutes later, we're up in Papatoe playing playing some cricket. So that was kind of how it was and she'd drop me off down at the, the bus stop and away we went. And there's only six, one 6.40 in your day <laughs> <Yeah>. these days. <laughs> uh, and being of similar ages, you're just a little bit younger than I am, um, inspirations, I mean, as, a, as somebody who, who made his name as a as a swing bowler for New Zealand? Um, it's probably a stupid question as to who might have been your inspiration. Well, yeah, it was an interesting one because I mean, obviously Sir Richard was um, someone I watched a lot growing up, but the guy I admired and, and used to love watching and didn't get to see enough of him was Andy Roberts from um, the West Indies, and uh, I. I Maybe it was about the aggression. Um, I don't know. It was a tad quicker than I ever was, but um, it was it was fantastic. Later in my life, and, and and when the cricket career finished and the broadcasting thing started, I ended up working with Andy in the Caribbean. Um, so it was a real thrill to sort of be on radio and TV with him and being able to tell him how much I sort of looked up to him as a youngster and and how much of an inspiration he was to uh, to me. Sort of 
he didn't um i mean he took it really well but he was a little bit embarrassed about the whole situation being on tv with it but um yeah it was great i, I absolutely looked up to him sir richard of course and um yeah and then just uh, you know guys at the club and and sort of brothers um, and can you remember your first your first ever competitive game? How old were you? What happened? Any memories of that? Not a lot, to be honest. Um, the you know the, the younger years they sort of flash by, I suppose, don't they? And you don't tend to remember too much. I remember a lot of school stuff um, when I probably started to get a bit more serious at school and playing with mates in first eleven, and and then um, I played uh, my first senior club game at fifteen. Um, which, you know, at that time was sort of not unheard of in our area, but it was, you know, it was it was a, a bit of a thrill at 15. You're still at school and you're playing senior club cricket. And I was actually playing with my brother as well, which was uh, which was nice. So, yeah, and I don't, I've not, never been one to remember um, actual incidents too much in games. There's the odd ones that stick out, but, um, you know, the, it's more about the, uh, you know, the, the, I guess, some of the games that stick out, but also the, the camaraderie and the mates you make along the way. And were you a good scholar? I mean, the, the you that I recall uh, with a sort of glint in his eye and that sort of, <laughs> never a, a, a smile never too far from the face. Were you a class joke or something like that? Yeah, more so, more so the class joke. There was a couple of things I excelled at. Um, maths was, was one that sort of helped along the way in, uh, in the punting side of things, um, <laughs> <laughs> which, which has been quite good. Um, but I had a brilliant teacher, and my, my Mr. Shoemaker, he was a, um, a trotting trainer. So he oh, trained, trained yeah, trotters. Yeah. So I used to sit up the front of the maths class because I loved it and we loved to talk racing. And, um, and so we got on really well, uh, did, did very well at, at, at maths and um, woodwork and um, that was about my lot. So I was always either going to be a builder or a mathematician or something along those lines. You didn't do what I did then. Um, I remember in, in history class at school, it was during the 1982 Cheltenham Gold Cup. I've actually right. got the transistor radio on <laughs> in my bag at the side of my desk, yeah. which was confiscated Brilliant. halfway through the uh, the final lap or whatever and <laughs> never saw it again. Yeah, I, I used to be let off on a Friday afternoon to go and roll the cricket pitch, which was always nice. So, uh, Mr. Mr. Schumacher would always let me go Friday afternoon about 1.30 to go and roll the pitch until school finished. So when did you? When does this moment come where you think, you know what, I can I can make a career out of this? Uh, I'd, I'd never made a rep team until I was nineteen. Uh, so I didn't make any. I came from a fairly unfashionable um, area where, in, in the Northern Districts area, which is sort of the home now to most of our top players, the Williamsons, Bolt, Southey, De Grandom, Wagner. Um, BJ Watling, all these guys come from Northern Districts where I played my cricket, but counties where I grew up was not a very fashionable area. If you didn't play for Hamilton, Northland or Bay of Plenty, the three sort of major minor associations, um, you really, very, really got to look in. So I didn't make a rep team until 19. Um, I went from that under 19 uh, Northern Districts team to playing the full team the next year. And then that was kind of it. That was the, the time I thought, okay. It was about the same time I came to uh, the UK for my first stint. And um, yeah, it all just sort of transpired from there, really. I, I don't, that was probably about the moment, I would imagine. I mean, we'll talk about the New Zealand thing, because obviously 32 tests is, is, is a reasonably serious career, but the, the major factor in your career was obviously turning out for Pudsey St. Lawrence in the Bradford <laughs> League. Um, no, I'm joking, folks. But it, but it, you know that's how we knew each other yeah. in the first place because um, you came and played there three or four seasons. In the uh, end, I had, I think I had two or three in a row yeah. and then came back again after I got injured on the New Zealand tour in 95, um, did my shoulder, had an operation at the um, Wellington Hospital right opposite Lords yeah. and came up and played as a batsman for the yes. 95 season, yeah. I think it was. So I came in, must've been 89 my first year at uh, Lawrence. And then um, I think I had at least two, maybe three years in a row and then another year in 95. Uh, and of course uh, that association maybe came through uh, playing playing a bit with Gott. Yeah, Chris, Chris Gott was in uh, New Zealand at Ellerslie and he um, had talked to, I can't remember who he talked to, someone about um, wanting an overseas player um, someone suggested that I might be, um, you know, be worth a, a look. And Chris and Debbie actually came down to my house for dinner, met mum and dad and yeah, introduced themselves. And that was kind of the, the start of a, a long friendship that's, uh, that's carried on to this day and, and hopefully it'll continue to, to grow. But, um, yeah, that was the first thing. And I mean, I was 
you just don't know, do you? You're a young kid, you think, why not? Mum said, mum and dad said, go for it. You know, so that was it. I was on the on the plane to the UK, uh, the end of the summer at home, and the start of the summer here. I'm digressing, folks, to, to Bradford League cricket here in Putsis and Lawrence. <laughs> Those of you who are not uh, from the north uh, might, might be thinking, who the heck are they? But a well, well-known club in the Bradford yeah. League, uh, Premier League in, in the north of England, um, famed for Sir Leonard Hutton. In fact, one of the stumps from his 364 record test score at the time from the Oval in 1938. He's still on the wall in the yeah. clubhouse. Um, and some very, very well-known players have played there over the years. And in fact, coming from where you come from, um, there was already a tradition of yeah. Kiwis. I mean... Funnily enough, I played a couple of evening league games with uh, a certain MD Crow yes. when he predecessed you. Uh, and Mark Greatbatch, of course. Had yeah, it was, very sort of, it was about nine or there. ten years, I think, of yeah. um, Martin Crow, Mark Greatbatch, then Chris Pringle. Pringle yeah. um, and Pring got selected for the ODI, I think it was, at Headingley. His New Zealand debut straight from Pudd St. Lawrence. They had, had some injuries. So, yeah, it was like at least eight or nine years of, of Crow, um, Greatbatch, Pringle, and then myself. And, um, you know, I, I think once you get a a sort of a, a taste for or a, a feeling for what so, sort of blokes you want at the club then they can recommend the next one along the line as well and that's kind of how it's always worked with with Lawrence and um yeah it's been it's been a you know it was a nice tradition and it's interesting to get your take on this um from a club cricket perspective knowing what you know from back home you'll have seen plenty of other places I'm sure on your travels mm. now around the world with your commentary as well as with your playing career but you clearly have got an affection for the place because whenever you come back, you try and make a beeline yeah. to go and spend an, at least an evening there, um, as you are doing, you know, in the next couple of days. Uh, hence, getting you in the studio. <laughs> but but what? How does that club measure up with others that you know? I mean, is it a good benchmark? Is it as good as we, as Putney St Lawrence people, think it is? Oh, I think it's probably the best, to be honest. Um, you know, New Zealand. We have we have some really good clubs in New Zealand, but the the sort of the whole club atmosphere at Pudge St. Lawrence to me, from the juniors right through is what clubs should be. It's that feeling that um, it's a home, you know, and it's a it's a social club as well as a, a cricket club. And I think that's the key, which is something we don't tend to have in New Zealand very, very much at all. Um, they tend to be just cricket clubs. You have your club rooms, they're busy on a Saturday or a Sunday and that's it. Um, very rarely are they busy during the week or do does anybody go there during the week? So. Um, you know, there's been some, you know, a long history of great people that have um, that have helped that club along the way, I'm sure. And uh, just to be a small part of it has been great. And I absolutely, any time I come to England, if I don't go up there, there's something wrong. Uh, you know, so I, I love the place. <laughs> okay, so PSL box ticked. We need to talk Test cricket. Uh, 32, 32 caps. Uh, we mentioned MD Crow, and in mm. fact, you get your Test debut in Bulawayo against yep. Zimbabwe with with him as the, the, I think the one and only Test he captained you for, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Yeah, he. Um, I, look, I still say that Martin Crow was in the top three cricketers I ever bowled a cricket ball to, um, and to do what he did under a bit of duress at times um, from media, from all sorts of you know the pressure that was on Martin. Uh, to do it in New Zealand conditions time and time again when it was really tough in those days as well. Green seeming pitches. Uh, the 188 he got in the West Indies and another one at the Gabba, I think, were just phenomenal. You know, two of the best test innings I'd seen at the time and, um, you know, gone way too early, obviously. Um, but yeah, good, a great thinker of the game. I mean, I know, you know, when I was here and, and prior to me being first here in 89, we were playing evening league. Hmm. The Sunkist League, I think it was at the time, or something like that. Um, you know, twenty over cricket. But Martin had great thoughts on the game as well, and and um, you know he introduced the cricket max, that sort of stuff. Um, and probably before his time, and he just that maybe just got a little bit too quirky for cricket. But it was a precursor to what we now know as T Twenty cricket around the world. Yeah, and, um, yeah, it was it was nice. So that that Test debut, it was I don't even wonder what I got. I got a, might have got a couple of wickets, and I, I may have. Andy Pycroft, who's a current referee, match referee, yep. or was a match referee, he might have been my first. I, I, I think I'm trying to sort of Come on, recall. You'd never no, forget I, that, surely. Well, I, I, mean, I don't know. I guess if it was Brian Lara, you'd never forget it. But <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Andy. Um, I, yeah, so I, I think I got a couple of wickets, and um, and that was better. I think we won the test. Rod Latham got a hundred. Uh, Tom Latham's dad yep. got a, got a, his one and only test hundred in that game. Um, Brian Lara, did you get him at any point? Good question. Uh, again, I, I look, I honestly don't know. 
I honestly don't know. I know I know he got me a couple of times at, uh, in Wellington, but I'm not sure whether I I'll ask him next time I see him. <laughs> How how soon uh, you know from from making that debut? How how quickly did you feel like you were established? Because it's it, whatever level of sport you play at, and whatever changing room you walk mm. into, you want to feel like you're part of that part of that fabric that you you you're worth your place, um, that you feel comfortable with it. Yeah. How how soon was um, that? I don't know whether it probably took till maybe ninety five ninety six till I felt really? like I was really established. And I had um, injuries were. A, you know the yeah. bane of my career to be honest um bad back and knees and and they just never really recovered but um you know first class cricket in new zealand was was okay but the jump to test match cricket was incredibly hard and so you had to you know it probably took six seven eight nine tests before you felt like you kind of knew what you were doing knew what you were in for and um and felt a, a part of the side and we kind of went through a little bit of a transition from the from the Crows and the Great Batches and the Rutherfords and all those things to that 95, 6, 7 time when Stephen Fleming, Nathan Astle, McMillan, mm. Cairns, Nash, yep. you know, kind of took over. And so it was about then that I started to feel a lot more comfortable, I think, in the side and, and you know, sort of valued, you know, a valued member, I, I guess. Because quite a lot of your early tests were under Ken Rutherford and then mm. later, obviously, Stephen Fleming, I think the predominance would have been played under him. What were they two like as captains? You know, compare and contrast, if you like. Um, Ken was um, Ken was a great thinker of the game, a really smart thinker of the game, and he still is. I mean, we still talk a lot about uh, you know he's in Australia now. We still talk a lot about what's going on in the game and where things are at. And um, he was a really good thinker of the game. Had a tough start to his test international career. Um, you know, got thrown at 19 and against the very, very strong West Indies side. Mm -hmm. So it was never going to be easy and, and it was probably always going to be better from then on in. But um, yeah, good thinker, um, good st strategist uh, around the game. And possibly, I think, he won't mind me saying this, I, I don't think he, I don't think we saw the best of Ken Rutherford at Test Cricket. You know, had the odd glimpse of it, but I don't really think we saw how good he, he was because he was a terrific player. Great player of the short ball, hook and cut. Um, and, and a gutsy, really gutsy cricketer. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, then Stephen kind of took over. Or Lee, we had a, a bit of a dodgy period with Lee Jamon and a yeah. couple of guys, you know, a couple of other sort of incidents around the Glenn Turner, Green Alabaster sort of coach manager time, which, yeah, didn't sit that well with me. I, I got left out of a, a West Indies tour because I had uh, earrings and a shaved head, so I didn't really fit the bill. Oh, um, so it was, it was nothing to do with cricketing ability. It was just... Um, it, it wasn't the the look they wanted for the New Zealand cricket team, uh, and then when Stephen Fleming came along and, and Steve Rickson, um, yep. you know that was kind of the time. That was my time when I thought, you know, Stumper Rickson was a, a great bloke, really good coach, and that was when it just sort of felt like it was. Um, we had a good side and, and a good captain, and it just everything just felt comfortable. Well, that's what I'm, I'm, I want to hear more about Stephen Fleming because watching television broadcasts um, back in those days, this was before I was broadcasting on, on cricket and. There was so much talk of we knew who the best side in the world were and they were across the Tasman. Mm. But if people used to say if he'd have had the best players in the world, you know, you'd never nobody could have come, come close to yeah. them because he was such a great tactician. Yeah. Would, would you agree? Very, very clever man. Um, very smart, just calm. You you, you watch, I mean, if you watch um, IPL now, you, you watch Stephen Fleming in the dugout, it's just flatline. You know, there's no ups, no downs. He's just emotionally so calm and, and cool. I mean, he could give you a rev up if you needed it, but you knew that when that happened, it was, he meant it and, and you know, he wanted something out of you. Um, but he read the game unbelievably well. He, you know, one of the early guys to say, well, this is your strength. We're going to feed your strength, you know, but we'll put a couple of men there and we'll, well, I mean, the Damian Martin story mm. with three backward points, mm. um, a gully and two backward points, you know, I mean, things like that, that you just think, well, that's kind of thinking outside the box. But he was a, I mean, he's destined to be a captain um, the whole time. And, um, you know, right through the, the underage stuff, that calm nature, one of the best slip fielders I think we've ever had. And we've got some good slippers now yep. in the New Zealand setup. But Stephen was one of the best slip fielders I think we've ever had as well to go along with that captaincy. And, and again, it's, I think it's a bit of a thing from a New Zealand point of view that I don't know that we ever saw Stephen Fleming, the real great test batsman, a lot of 50s, mm -hmm. you know, didn't convert. Uh, he's a guy that I think should have averaged 45, 45 to 50, but probably the captaincy just 
took away it from that a little bit. And is that also because when you look down the list of players, and this is certainly not to belittle anybody in the New Zealand side, but when you look at the, the 11s that were going out on the field by comparison to, say, Australia, mm. uh, West Indies, um, the top sides in the world at the time, it maybe felt a bit more pressure that he had to produce the goods and there was so much more on him. Yeah, I think so. Um, I, particularly the top of the order. You know, he was always in... Well, not always, but but more often than not, he was in early. Uh, you know, we struggled to find opening combinations. I think we went through, you know, 15, 16 opening combinations in the space of four or five years here at one stage. So when he had a, a settled side and, and, and that 97, 98, 99, when we came to England, um, you know, he had a very settled side and then around him then and, and felt quite comfortable, um, whether it be Bell and Horn or... Um, whoever was at the top of that that order, but the, the middle order of Fleming and Astle, McMillan, Cairns was, you know, he felt fairly comfortable in and around that. So I think that was when we probably saw um, a little bit more of, of of Stephen Fleming. And you've already alluded to the fact that you battled with with injuries quite a lot during your career. I mean, if if you'd have had an injury free run at things, it was was captaincy of your country ever something that would have interested you? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, I, I think that. Bowlers being captain are always a bit tough. Um, I mean, I know there's been some, but you know, and I, England have had a, a two or three, haven't they? I can think of Bob Willis yeah. at, at times, beefy captain on the odd occasion, didn't he? Um, but very rarely to, to sort of, particularly opening bowlers and, and and quick bowlers make great captains. I think you just your, your job is to. You know, you don't see enough of the game. Yeah. Yeah. And, and when you bowled your over, you kind of just want to be down on that boundary, just yeah. chilling out and, yeah. and and having a bit of a rest. Um, yeah, and uh, going back to the injuries, though, that was the biggest, you know, my biggest sort of bugbear, I suppose, through that time was we had Chris Cairns, myself, and Dion Nash at, you know, at any one stage from 1992, 91, 92, when we all played, to 99, 2000. Now, we only played three test matches together. That's one of us was injured. Hmm or not playing at any one stage yeah. for a nine year period yeah. that we played, I think three test matches together, which, you know, and, and when we played together, you felt like New Zealand had a, Daniel Vittori, yeah. you felt like New Zealand had a really good bowling attack. And then you had McMillan and Astle who could bowl a few overs for yeah. you as well. And, you know, so Nashi was a very good batsman. Cairns, you know, Vittori at, at sort of 10 and myself at 11. And that was, you know, that was our, that was our best side. And we just didn't play enough together. We're sitting here now talking just in the in the light of the aftermath of, of a, the best thing that's ever happened to New Zealand cricket in terms of mm. being top of the tree in the ICC World Test Rankings, courtesy of beat, beating India in the, the recent final. We'll come back to that. Maybe it's a nice way to finish things off, but but just to get to that point, is it the the foundations of that in the Martin Crows and the Stephen Flemings of that of this world in the in the eighties nineties? Um, yeah, a little bit. the The best thing that's happened to New Zealand cricket, I think, in the last. Now, and I'd go back probably 8, 10, 12 years, is it, it was a conscious decision to make our pitches a lot better. And by better, I mean harder, faster, uh, and just better for batting. So batsmen could go out and get hundreds and double hundreds and triple hundreds. And if you didn't swing the ball or bowl fast, you were not going to be successful. Mm -hmm. And so it's produced quality bowlers, and it's produced very technically very good batsmen. And I think if you compare the, the the New Zealand setup in the Test series against England to what we saw from the England players, now I know Rory Burns picked up a hundred at Lords and and guys will get runs, but you look at probably Joe Root, who's the most similar to a Latham, Conway, Williamson, yep. uh, Nichols. They're just technically very good players, and it. That's what New Zealand cricket has been able to produce. And then you produce guys that swing the ball or bowl sort of relatively quick or back of a length and bounce bowlers like um, Kyle Jamieson. We don't produce a lot of spinners. That's been one of the downfalls of it. When we do tour the subcontinent, mm -hmm. it's been tough for us. Um, but, you know, those guys that in, in that World Test Championship final, and Kane Williamson's a student of the game. He, he knows the history. Ross Taylor's a real student of the game. They know the history. They know that what they did it for was not only themselves but for a lot of you know a lot of guys in the past as well Ken Williamson you mentioned best three format Oof. player with the bat that New Zealand have ever produced ever yeah 100% um, you know he's he's absolute quality uh, I think this uh, this 
South African Kiwi that we've got now is, is going to be pretty good too, to be honest with you. I think in all three formats, he's just, once he just reeled off his third 50 in a row, I think, for um, Somerset. So, you know, Devin Conway is going to be a, a heck of a player as well. Yeah, looked uh, very good in that recent, uh, in the demise of England, shall we say, <laughs> yeah. uh, recently. Oh, um, okay, so where do we go with this? We, we talked about your, your your knee injuries, your back problems as well. Um, before we get to the end of the test career bit, we need to talk about the, the good stuff. And, and let's talk about the India um, the India performance. Boxing Day mm. at the Basin Reserve Wellington, seven foot, including... The entire top five in that Indian lineup: uh, Sachin Tendulkar, Raul Dravid, Saurav Ganguly, all involved. Mm. But this one still comes out in a bar now and again, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, now and then, now and then it does. Um, it was, yeah, it was New Zealand's first ever Boxing Day test as well. Which um, so, you know, history it was it was a great day, and it was one of those Wellington days that you very rarely get. It was just a really light um, southerly breeze, which is a, a really nice breeze to bowl. And um, yeah, lovely day, ball swung, you know, tinge of green in the surface, which which always helps. And um, yeah, just, I mean, it was, it was bizarre because I had the first seven. And so by that stage, people are going, you know, there's yeah. murmurs around, you know, your, your, your Lakers and things like that. But, um, and it was almost a relief because I, I think I was in, I don't know, my 11th or 12th over in the spell. And it was almost a relief when Dion Nash got the eighth wicket because it was like, Whew, I can have a bit of a rest now. <laughs> um, he, he shouldn't be thinking like that, but the, the sort of the pressure started to, to to go on. And when you've got the first seven in the order, and you're thinking, well, is it possible? Could it happen? Uh, and I think Nashy got Kumble or someone like that out, um, and that was yeah, as I say, a bit of a relief. But um, you know, you have you have few of those days. I mean, I don't think of I, I think I bowled as well on days, but you just Mm. didn't pick up the wickets and mm. and that's what um test test cricket's all about but it was great to have that day and then and then the boys go on to win the test as well come on how do you how do you set up Sachin Tendulkar um well Sachin was uh, you know an incredible player or you know was an incredible player too he always I always felt that there was a chance early he he liked to feel the bat on the ball mm -hmm. he um he wasn't a big lever of, of the ball and and so in those sorts of conditions you kind of felt that if you give you a chance if you bowled straight to him now I think that day to be honest I think he clipped a half volley on leg stump to to leg to um square leg to short square leg I think that day but um yeah I always felt that he gave you an opportunity early on it, it was just a chance early on to to get him and if he got going it was very very difficult to stop so yeah, it's just that Small window before he got to ten or eleven. I suppose you had to be honest about that clipping a yeah. leg stump half volley. You, you couldn't say, you know, <laughs> no. middle and middle and leg, and it nipped no, away until people, the off People will find out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Um, I mean, what what sort of gave you the most pleasure then about bowling in Test cricket? Was it on those days when it was an absolute, you know, shirt fronter, and you've got just a couple? Maybe because you haven't worked really, really hard, you, you stem in the flow of runs and you find a way. Or is it is it on the the days when it's doing all sorts of? Um, to me, the the most pleasure comes when you perform well and your team wins. And, and so, winning Test matches was you know was, and being part of winning Test matches was the key really for me. So when I, if I got wickets and we won, those days always felt a lot better. And so whether it was easy or hard. Whether that whether it was two wickets or five wickets, um, you know your, your small contributions with the bat, even at times, um, they were the, you know they were the pleasurable ones. I mean, I remember getting one not out against Australia at Hobart, and Shane O'Connor and I batted for thirteen overs, fourteen overs. He got naught not out, and I got one not out, and we saved the test, and we were nine down at the time. And I took um, McGrath and rifle I think from one end and he felt being the left hander and a big tall left hander he could take Warren from the other um, <laughs> as you do <laughs> well all you were looking to do was block it and and so we just decided that we weren't I, I was at Warney's end when he came out to bat and he said just get one he said I'll try and look out I'll just try and get my big front dog down the pair down the pitch and and you know kick it or block it and um, so I swept I think I swept the first ball looped in the air just short of the guy at backward square and that was the only run I got and spent the rest of the time down the other end and then you know we sat in the changing room with the Aussies till 
two o'clock in the morning. You know, I'm just sitting there with Boone and, yep. uh, you know, in the wars and, and you know, Mark War and I being, you know, pretty good mates. We talked punting and racing and stuff yep. and Booney was sitting there. So those are the days you kind of really remember. And, and I think the wins are great, but, the, the off the field stuff, you know, the, yeah. the sitting in that Aussie change room till one o'clock in the morning was, was you know, one of the highlights. So who were the great guys to, to well, Mark Wobb, uh, clearly a, a case in point, but who were the great guys to play against? Who did you most look forward to playing against regularly, both for the socials and for the, the competition aspect of things? And who were the ones that you'd, you kind of not cross the street now to, <laughs> to say hello to? Um, oh, England were always great to play against. Um, and, you know, and we, we have some good conversations now when I come over here with NASA and, and Athers and, and those sorts of guys yeah. who I, I played a little bit against. Um, you always wanted to beat Australia, although that happened very, very rarely in my time. Um, but the, the tours, you know, the tours now, and I, I absolutely love touring the subcontinent now. I, I went back to Pakistan earlier this year, excuse me, the first time since 1998, I think it was, 1999. Um, you know, I'd been back to Pakistan. So those tours kind of make you as a, as a person as yeah. well. And, and my love for India now, and yeah, it's provided a, a great um, living for me and, and, and a work environment for me as well. But I mean, I, I just love going back there. Um, it was very rarely did, we played against a very good Zimbabwe side. You know, yeah. it, was a, it was top yeah, quality yeah. Zimbabwe side, not the, the sort of, of this world. Yeah, yeah, flowers and the Whittles and Heath Streak and um, Strang and, and, you know, all those guys that were very, very good players. So, yeah, I don't, there's not really, I mean, South Africa I love, love, and I've got some good mates in South Africa, you know, Brian McMillan's a, a, a good mate, and I sort of always catch up with, with Big Mac when I go back over there and Stephen Jack and, um, you know, Polly and those sorts of guys. So the, 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 the sort of people I've met and and been able to you kind of judge your career on wherever you go. Can I ring someone up for a game of golf or a beer? Right, and that, that's kind of how I judge my <laughs> career. Um, and it you know might sound a little bit flippant, but that's kind of how I judge it. I, I think you know if, if I go to a country, can I ring someone up and have a game of golf or a beer or a dinner? And and if I've got more than a handful of guys in every country that I can do that to, then I think I've done it right. And do you buy them? Oh yeah. I always buy them at Lawrence, I tell you that much. <laughs> <laughs> you know what Yorkshiremen are like? <laughs> well, uh, notoriously uh, careful, shall we say. Correct, careful correct. with our with our money. Um, so you you mentioned uh, India. Um, let's go to the IPL. Let's just jump out, out of the, the playing career into the commentary career. I mean, just give us a, a brief on on how you got into the commentary thing in the first place and then and then take us to the IPL because mm. you've been in there from pretty much the start I think yeah a first year and the only one that's done every IPL so um yeah it's been that's quite cool um a couple of guys have had a, a year or two off here and there and um for, for varying reasons um commentary came about again through Martin Crow. he was at Sky in, in New Zealand so um I'd been doing when I left cricket I had a liquor shop for a couple of years sold wine and beer and um then went to uh, radio, so I did breakfast radio for uh, six years on a on the rock radio station. So it was all music, right? All music. So you didn't yeah. do sport for them. So I, yeah. I read the sport, right? But um, it was a music based right. um, rock station. So yeah, so that was great fun. Kind of gave me a grounding. I mean, as you know, radio is very good for TV because it's always live. Yeah. And you know, I know we record this sort of these things nowadays, but when the mic goes on in radio, it's live. So it's great for for you preparation for television um and yeah so martin crow got offered me a job at sky in 2007 8 i think it was and um yeah that was a year later the ipl started and i got a gig uh doing that i just emailed someone emailed the right person got offered the job and um i've been there ever since and uh, look it, it's it's just an incredible tournament uh, from you look at it and you say okay it's changed people's lives whether it be monetary um, which I'll, I'll never begrudge. I think, um, you know, players get paid what they're worth and everybody in this world gets paid what they're worth. And I, I feel, and, you know, so I've never begrudged the players for, for making millions and millions of dollars out of it. It is something that if you haven't been, you need to try and go. It, it, the, the atmosphere in, in Wankiri Stadium and, you know, in Chinnaswamy, Kolkata, it, it's just, it blows you away. The, the, the quality of cricket is, is very, very good. Um, you know, you've got four of the best overseas players in general terms in most sides. And the, the what it's done for Indian cricket has been phenomenal. Bringing their youth through, the guys that, that come through into that international side now, just, I mean, they have no fear. 
and, and it's changed their game for, for the better as well. You, you may have to be careful about what you say in your response there, but that, has that changed? It's clearly changed the balance of power in the world game. Is that for the good? Do, do other, is it up to other nations now to catch up with that? Or have they, have they actually got any hope of catching up when you've got the 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 player pool, if you like, that India has? Mm, I think it's going to be very difficult for other nations to, to catch up. Um, they're still, I mean, India are not unbeatable. You know, New Zealand have just proven that and, and they, they do, they, they lose. They're very, very difficult to beat at home. Um, that that's certainly one thing. Um, look, they hold the power because that's where the money is in world cricket, and every country in the world needs them. And you know, you see what's going on with England now. Now, I, I think, I think the England. I'm looking forward to the hundred. I'm looking forward to watching it, see how it works. But England jumped on the wrong bandwagon with the West Indies mm-hmm. situation and with um, our man who's in in jail. Yeah. Um, you know, they had a chance to jump on the IPL bandwagon and the Champions League and all that stuff and they said no no we know better we're, we're going to go with um, we're going to go with the West Indies and, yeah. and this you know and they, they saw the early dollar signs but then they didn't realise probably how big the IPL was going to be and and now they are actually allowing their players to, to go and ply their trade and they're becoming a little bit more flexible with it and it's only a good thing it's a good thing now the one issue around other people making money and big money out of the game they'll never really do that until the Indian players are allowed to play. Mm. Now, if the Indian players were allowed to play in the 100, two per team, say, the, the audience ratings all of a sudden go from, you know, a million to 50 million. Yeah. Um, and, and that's the key. But what India do very, very well and what the BCCI do very, very well is they hold on to that great commodity, which is their players. They are the cash cow. And so they pay them enough to make sure they don't go anywhere and they don't want to go anywhere. And that's probably how it works. As somebody who played in uh, one day internationals as well, but never T- T20 hadn't started, no. had it by the time you retired. No. I'm sure you played T20 as it was <laughs> in junior cricket or whatever. But yeah, uh, an evening league stuff. Mm. Um, well, I mean, would you have fancied, the finance, finances aside, would you have fancied the challenge of playing T20 cricket? Because it's not a bowler's game, is it? No, it's not. Look, I mean, at times I struggle with the white ball and struggle with white, uh, one day cricket, but. It, look, you'd have to have developed your game completely differently. Um, it, it's mentally just one of those tough, tough games. I'd have worked a heck of a lot harder on my batting, I think, so that I could offer maybe two or three overs and and maybe some runs at, at six or seven. I'd have probably just made myself work a lot harder on, on the batting side of things, particularly at that domestic level. I think that would have been probably more something I would have looked forward to. So no regrets in, in that respect? You're happy if you played when you did? Yeah, absolutely. Look, I mean, cricket, and I, I keep telling people, I have a lifestyle that pays now. I don't have a job. Um, I get to travel the world and talk a little bit of crap about something I once did 20-odd <laughs> years ago. You know, and, and it, it's it's an absolute privilege to, to be able to, to do what I do. And um, yeah, it, look, the game owes me absolutely nothing. Pulling up stumps originally on it in in two thousand because of the injury sitch, and then going back and uh, playing in in the, ne- the Netherlands. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us about the the end and the, and the resumption. Yeah, well, I um I, I stopped because my knee was absolutely knackered. I've now got a full um, knee replacement, so I've got I've had that for five uh, six years now. I had a full replacement, which has changed my life in in some ways. Um, I got a call from a, a good mate, Alex O'Dowd, who um some will know from North. Hampton Rugby now. Okay. I think. I think it's Northampton. I hope I got that right, Dowdy. Um, and his son, Max, is playing for Holland, opening the batting for Holland. Um, so he was at uh, Haas CC in, in, um, in Holland, and I'd been retired for two years, I think it was, at three. 2003, I think I went over there. Uh, and he said, look, we've lost our overseas pro, who was Paul Hitchcock, played a little bit of cricket for New Zealand as well, a little medium pacer. And um, we need someone. I said, mate, I haven't had a game. Haven't played for, for three years since I retired. He said, don't worry about it. He said, well, we'll have a physio and a, and a masseuse on standby every Monday morning for you. Just come over and, and give it a go. He said, we've got 12 games left or 11 games left and we need someone. So, yeah, I actually, I don't regret it. It was, it was so much fun. I struggled the first couple of weeks, first couple of games, um, but absolutely loved it. It was very different playing on the matting. Um, but uh, yeah, saved them from relegation and away we went. Oh, what a hero, what a hero. <laughs> so tell us about Magic Talk. Is that where you are yeah. these days? Um, so I did um, the start of the summer on, on radio. So Sky lost the um, TV rights and I've, all, you know, I've been a Sky guy 
for 13 years. So when they lost the TV rights, um, I didn't uh, end up working for Spark, the opposition. And um, yeah, I started back and in, got back into radio. Um, very different. Uh, mm. You, I found myself in the early times, and I mean, you, you're used to doing the ball by ball commentary and you've, you've just got to do it. And I found myself missing, missing a ball now and then because I'm so used to doing television yeah. that you just forget to say, you know, that Thompson's on his way in yeah, now because and, you bowls can see and it's it. outside yeah. the line of off stump because yeah. yeah. I'm watching and I can see it and you, and you just forget. Mm. You forget and so you find yourself catching up a ball every now and then. Um, but I loved it. It was great. It was great to be back and we had John Bracewell and um, – you know, got some new guys that got had the Marshall brothers, Hamish and James, in to do some uh, yeah. some stuff as well. So it was good fun. Um, whether I do it again the summer back home uh, next year will be time will tell. But uh, I, I really enjoyed it because we in 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 England we'd say that that Dules, um, along with Ian Smith, um, probably Jeremy Coney, would be the three voices of of New Zealand mm -hmm. cricket these days whether one you, you mentioned martin crow we knew him as a player he, yeah you know he wasn't on any of our broadcasts really he might yeah. turn up as a guest yes. you know, on sky or whatever before a test match and that would probably be about it who were the who was the voices that you you love to listen to when you were watching or listening to cricket broadcasts growing up um i mean brian waddle was always the yeah. radio voice of of new zealand and um you know wads used to travel with us actually he would travel on a team bus he would travel in the especially in the subcontinent yeah. and in and around um so wads was uh you know absolutely brilliant i mean one of the best at, at, at his job um listening to tony cozier was probably mm -hmm. my of overseas guys, Tony Cozy was my favourite. Um, and again, getting to work with Tony after listening yeah. to um, you know to the commentary in the middle of the night and little things like um, the the oh gosh what to one one of the New Zealand tours there and I'm, I'm listening to the radio late at night and Tony Cozy is sort of marshals into Crow and it's short and Crow hooks and. That is through to Dujon. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. <laughs> you, you listen to it. it. I yeah. mean, he, he had. I, I won't try and mimic the voice, but it was just a wonderful, wonderful voice. And now work with Tony's son Craig mm -hmm. as well, who's uh, a, a great statistician and and um, real student of of the game of cricket. So yeah, look, Tony Cozier for me was just unbelievable. TV guys, you, it's hard to go past Richie, isn't it? I mean, yeah. the, the great Richie Benno, and um, yeah, they just great to listen to as much as it pains us as kiwis and and brits to say that as a, an aussie but to be fair he felt like he was an england supporter yeah. when he was doing the, the the bbc broadcast yes yeah um one other thing i wanted to say about your playing career i know we've really wrapped that up but I, what a great time to be around as well you mentioned in tony cozier that great west indies side yeah. was coming out of its time as the top of the world and there was that transition period in the 90s from them to australia it uh, must have been a, a a really interesting time to be actually playing your trade at that yeah, level. Yeah, it, it was. I mean, and every era has, you know, you look around, every era has a great team or great players, but that through that 90s time, I mean, you know, when you look at even what the West Indies started to, to get back when you had um, Walsh and Ambrose and Brian Lara, um, Carl Hooper was still mm -hmm. sort of floating around then as well. So that was great. But I mean, I remember a tour to Australia where their top seven all got test match hundreds against us in a three test series. You know, and on my first tour there, I think it was yeah, Boone and Taylor and um, Slater and, you know, the, the War Brothers and then Heels at seven, whoever it was at six. Um, you know, they all got hundreds against us in a, in a three test series. It was tough. And then not only that, they pile the runs on and then you've got McDermott and McGrath and Warren to deal with as well. So um, they were an incredibly good side. Uh, but then, you know, Wazim and Wacker, Pakistan, and as I say, Courtney and um, and Kirtley, and then Alan Donald and Sean Pollock, or, mm. or you know, whether it was Fani de Villiers and Alan Donald, or, you know, in, in those um, times there. So they were, uh, you know, Murali and Chimin You had to cope with, with them and... and that Sri Lankan side, so there were some great, great cricketers, um, you know, through that through that nineties time as well. So good, you know, good people to play against. You know, it's folks. He it didn't mention Goff and Caddy. He didn't mention a single <laughs> English bowler there, and that's because England were on their way down. In they fact, were. You, you played in the series, and you when England end, ended up bottom of the pile on, yes. in, in the world rankings. Yeah, yeah, they did. I mean, we England came to New Zealand. Um, had I think I think they did okay in New Zealand in that in the nineties one stage and then when we came here uh 94 with crowey um 
and I think we lost that series in '94, but then we came back in '99 and won the series yeah. with you know with Stephen and and Cairns and McMillan and Astill and that lot there. So it was um, that they weren't. I wouldn't have wouldn't have said that if you look at English cricket, the '90s is a much talked about era. No. I'm, guess, I'm guessing that that might get raised in, in the commentary box with NASA from time to time. <laughs> time to time, time to time. He, he cops it well though, Nass, and um, you know he was a he, he's a competitor, hell of a competitor, Nass Hussain. Yeah, um, two hundred against the Aussies, and and then you can bat. Yeah, whatever it was in the tenth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. always gets <laughs> always gets raised, doesn't it? Yes. Okay, um, so let's bring it up to date because. Um, you know, your wonderful nation is now mm. top of the tree. And I think we've got an affinity. We, we, I mentioned the Aussie thing, but there is that. But I think, you know, we just we just get on well as nations, if you like, don't we? There's a bit of na- uh, mutual respect there. We had that great 2019 um, 50 mm. over final uh, and all that went with that. We probably don't need to labour that one again <laughs> from your perspective anyway. We can talk about it from an English perspective. But to, to get to the top of the tree, when you think about the the player pool in New Zealand mm. by comparison to other nations and to beat India um, in in a final in England. I mean, talk us through what, what you feel like. <laughs> yeah, it, look, it was amazing. I mean, incredible to be a part of it. Um, great for those guys. And, you know, when you think about the, the career of Ross Taylor, um, the career of Tim Southey, uh, I think, you know, they're the next two to probably come to the end of it. Um, Ross sooner rather than later, I would imagine. Um so for them and that team who have worked incredibly hard to be able to get to the top of the world and and I mean I'm pleased that the ICC put that sixth day on as well because mm. it made sense and um, you just you look you never know with 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 the weather in uh, in the UK we had a, a scorching two and a half weeks and then all of a sudden we had that that awful week which just happened to coincide with the World Test Championship final um, but to be able to do that um, get into that sixth day and and New Zealand were just the better team. And, you know, it just shows you that I think all I did, all my study that I did prior to that test match was all around batsmen in English conditions. What you did in India, what you do in New Zealand actually made no difference whatsoever. And the New Zealand batting stats in the UK, far, far better than the Indian stats in the UK. Only one of the Indian players averaged more than 30. Coley was at 36 and the rest of them were all around about 31 or under. Um, you know, in the 20s, we had three New Zealand players who average over 40 in, the, in England. Um, you know, the county cricket experience uh, as well of, of um, the likes of, of Latham, um, Williamson, Taylor. You know, th- th- those guys have all been here, um, done that. So I think that really made a big difference. But the, the, the New Zealand were always a good side. In the last year, the addition of Kyle Jamieson and Devin Conway has made them a very, very good side. And I think that's been they're two of the pieces that have just been missing a little bit, and they've provided that. At risk of asking a silly question, but I'm not averse to doing that. I mean, is this the greatest New Zealand yep. side of all time? Easy. Easy. Easy answer. Absolutely. Um, New Zealand cricket has never been better as far as strength and depth is, con- is concerned, and I think that was shown in that second test match against England. You change six players and still go out there and put that performance on. Matt Henry misses out on the World Test Championship final after getting man of the match in, in Birmingham, you know. Uh, brilliant performance. So there, there's there's strength in numbers, uh, and there's a direct replacement, I think, for all of those guys on that side. So BJ Watling obviously retiring. Tom Blundell just walks into that spot because he's he's been there. He's, he's already had a taste of it. Test match 100 on debut in Wellington. Yeah. Um, you know, dropped seven times, but but um, got 100 in, in Australia against the Aussies. So there, there's direct replacements for, for all of these guys now. And a great way to finish that, I guess, and this is putting you on the spot, but you've, you've got that as the nucleus of your all-time greatest New Zealand eleven. Who do you take out to put in uh, Sir Richard, uh, to put in Martin Crow? Um, you obviously got to, yeah. you've got to reserve a place for yourself. We'll let you do that. <laughs> so you, no. you need at least three men out. I, I, look, I think if we were, if you were to throw uh, Daniel Vittori has to go yep. into has to go into an all-time side. Sir Richard Hadley has to go into an all-time side, and Martin Crow has to go into an all-time side. So there's three that have to go in. Um, I mean, if I was looking at a bowling attack that consisted of Hadley, Bolt, Southey, it's too early to put Jameson in, so mm-hmm. I'm going to leave. I'll, I'll leave him out. Okay. Um, Vittori, 
uh, that would be okay. Um, I'm probably taking out um, Henry Nichols and, and, and putting Martin Crow in. So you've got Williamson, Taylor, Crow, which doesn't look like a bad three, yeah. four, five, no matter which order you put them in. Um, Ross would probably have to bat five. Martin probably four, um, yeah. uh, which would be okay. Latham, um, again, Conway, you probably have to leave out and maybe put Glenn Turner in. Mm. Um, okay. You know, just because he's too new. Yeah. Uh, but I think Tom Latham's one of New Zealand's best ever openers. And um, and I'm, I'm not playing Colin de Grondheim and I'm probably putting Chris Cairns in. Oh, Chris Cairns, well, what a, ta- what so, a talent. And of course, you know, if, with if that was sort of, if that was to be the, the, the greatest ever side, it wouldn't be far off. There we go. Wrapped up the best New Zealand side-ish uh, of all time. Um, Simon Dool, uh, many thanks for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure catching up with you again uh, and talking cricket and about your career yeah. and getting your opinions. Thanks very much. No, I really enjoyed it. Um, so that was Dooley. Stick around for more Sporting Lives with Jonathan Doidge. Um, at Sporting Lives 1 is the Twitter feed. Uh, you can find me as well on Facebook on at Sporting Lives 1 or at Jonathan Doidge on Twitter. Or you can mail me as well with suggestions for future guests. We'll see what we can do. Jonathan Doidge at hotmail.com. That's it for now. We'll see you next time.